In May 2017, there was an article in Bloomberg that said China just became the games industry capital of the world. But uh, guess what? We already knew that because they said that when they realized, probably by reading our press release, they realized that uh, China is fully responsible for 25% of the global games revenue and nearly half or at least more than 40% of global PC games revenue. And that is really impressive number since it's one country, but it is a significant amount of the population of the world, as you know. We have been covering this market since why you should even listen to me at all. We've been covering this market for 16 years. We are a market research firm. We've got offices in Shanghai, Silicon Valley, and Bangkok, and evidently Uber from the west side of LA. We have that office too. And our, our clients are game publishers, developers, hardware makers, component like chip manufacturers, um, law firms, consulting firms, governments, that not all at the same time because we're just a small company, but every now and then one of these types of companies will call us up and we'll do a little work for them. And we create market size and forecast information for China and greater Southeast Asia. We also do what's called demand-based research. So we are really interested in what the Chinese gamers tell us they're doing and what they like to do. And we do focus groups with them. We do surveys with them. We visit their houses. We go to internet cafes. We play the games they want to play and all sorts of stuff. So we try to get in the mind, and we have an office in Shanghai, as I mentioned, so we try to get in the mind of Chinese gamers to, to really understand what goes on there. So we started this way back 16 years ago, long before Bloomberg got to the party at 2017 to say, by the way, China's big. We knew it was going to be big, and it is big, and it's getting bigger. So let's talk about that a little bit. China is a market unto its own. So we think that the experience of Chinese gamers is different from Western gamers. And those of you who raised your hands, some of you, I don't know where you were born or where you grew up, but maybe you have experience gaming in China and gaming here. It's a whole different vibe. So in China, first of all, there are more than, almost more than two times as many people playing games in China as there are people in the United States of America. That's a lot of gamers. And so together, that collective enthusiasm has a lot of energy that goes with it. Their behavior is uh, they really enjoy leveling up. They really enjoy um, accelerating in the game, getting to the next level, being competitive, even to the point that they will turn off the graphics of the pretty images of pictures of the games just to get a little extra speed, a little edge on the next guy to see that they can win or get there faster. There are a lot of preferences that they have for gaming that uh, it was interest one interesting point is even people who play mobile games also play PC, PC also plays mobile, and a lot of these are playing what we call core games, which means they are more challenging, they require more sophisticated gameplay. Unlike me, I play words with friends and that kind of stuff. These gamers are playing a lot more uh, extensive set of games at the same time. There are about 150,000 internet cafes in China, and you'd be hard pressed to find one over here in Los Angeles. There are some that are being built for esports, arenas that are being built for esports or, or um, event spaces that are being repurposed for esports. Esports, by the way, is competitive gaming usually for money, and uh, in case you missed it, Intel had the Intel Extreme Masters in Pyeongchang for the Olympics, like alongside the Olympics, there was global competition of gaming at the same time as the Olympics, and there is a push to have esports, professional gaming, entered as an Olympic sport, and so you might see that. So we don't know exactly when, but that's possible. But in internet cafes, the, the main reason to go used to be because it was utilitarian. A lot of people didn't have their own PCs or maybe there was not broadband connectivity to their town or they lived in a city in a tier four or tier five 
which does anybody know what I mean by when I say tier four or tier five? So Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou, those are tier one. And then like the province capitals are tier two, basically. This is very simplified. Um, and then tier three, it gets maybe the second or third biggest city in the province. And not only do we look at the size of the population, but also the, the availability of technology and the propensity to spend disposable income on technology or digital entertainment. These are all important for us when we look at these tiers. Uh, but in internet, cafe, internet cafes were often used utili as utilitarian places to play games or access the internet. And then along came uh, lower prices of home PCs and home broadband. Many people had their own so the usage of internet cafes was falling off until the advent of a certain genre, which means like a category of games called MOBA, Multiplayer Online Battle Arena Games. And the most famous game in that genre is called League of Legends. And League of Legends was a super big hit, is still very popular, and people were flocking to internet cafes because that game is played in five person against five person environment. We call it 5v5. And the internet cafes would align all their seats to have five people on one side and five people on the other, and everyone would go to town. So you would see a lot of usage in the iCafes for this kind of game. Uh, but now there's a new popular game called PUBG, Players, Player Unknown Battlegrounds. And that game um, has taken over some of the usage of League of Legends and also drove usage to internet cafes, but we saw a dip when the popularity of League of Legends had started to wane, and now, then PUBG came, and now we're gonna see a dip again. And so now it's utilitarian for specific games, not for internet access. It's a different purpose. Esports, I already kind of explained what that is. This is tournament play and uh, having perhaps amateur tournaments, but also professional tournaments with big money payouts. And I'll talk a little bit later a lot more about esports, so you'll learn more. Regulations in China, that's the single biggest barrier to success for any company, especially in the game space. The government controls all content. So if you control all content, you have, it's a, you have to jump through a lot of hoops to get your game released there. They also control the telecom infrastructure, which means all foreign companies must partner with a domestic company in order to publish or launch a game there. And there are all sorts of other rules that govern the usage by uh, young people under age 18 and people in general. So there are a lot of regulations and they're always evolving. That's the trick. Spending. Um, Gamers don't spend a ton of money, but in China, the aggregate value is huge money. So for the most part, games in China are free, free to play, free to access, free to play, except they generate $26 billion of revenue every year on free games. $26 billion on free games. So how does that work? Well, there's something called an in-game economy. People spend real money to buy virtual items or dress up their avatar. Hey, I, I like Lisa's blue scarf. I'm gonna go buy one for my character or whatever the case may be. In some cases, they make you pay to chat with your friends or pay to level up faster and lots of different things. But Chinese gamers love the virtual economy. This actually, the idea of online gaming with free to play games uh, was born in China, I think, perhaps in Korea but I think mostly in China, where there was a super high rate of piracy for packaged products, and the game companies had to come up with a business solution of piracy, and so they said, let's just give the games away for free and make them pay for the service to access them. So first there were subscription models for that access to the games, and then they, there was a further evolution of that business model to introduce these free-to-play games whereby the gamers could pay they felt like they were paying less money because they could pay for whatever they wanted to do in the game instead of be forced to pay a flat fee in the game. And it turns out that people spend a lot more money when then they get to choose what they're gonna spend it on. So that's why this game market has been growing, 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 growing. There aren't a lot of uh, other inexpensive modes of entertainment other things to do for entertainment can be a lot more costly or more cumbersome or you're too far away from your friends and so you would rather be in the virtual world. 
Um, and I want to explain the last one, Android mobile games distribution. So we have iPhone and we have the rest. iPhone has iOS and the rest basically use Android. And the Apple uh, ecosystem in, has the Apple Store. In China, there is a China Apple Store, and that serves up all the games to any iOS phone. However, on the other side, unlike here, where you would go to Google Play exclusively, pretty much, to get your Android game, there's no Google in China, as much to their chagrin, but there are about 500, literally, alternatives for Android game distribution. Probably only the top 20 matter, but it's still a lot of Android stores to keep track of. So this is a very different way to do business than in the United States. Let's talk about that market a little bit more closely. If we look at the global market size, by the way, uh, the global data is courtesy of our friends at Super Data Research. That's another games industry market research firm. We specialize in Asia. They do the world. They kind of do a top-down approach. We do demand-based research. We're friends. Anyway, uh, so they have provided some, some global numbers. And you can see this nice red line is Asia, making up 27% of the world in 2017, according to them. And the vast majority of that is coming from China. In 2022, look at Asia now, $82 million billion. And the rest of the world, and a 10% growth rate, the only other place you see that high of a growth rate is here in Africa, but it's $677 million. It's not n anywhere near as, as amazing. So we're uh, tracking the right market, I think, because th th there is a lot of life left in the games market in Asia. In China specifically, we look here, and the, and the data is not exactly apples to apples. Maybe you noticed the other slide was 2022. This is 2021. That's because this slide is our data and our updated 2018 data, which will forecast through 2022, is coming out in April. So right now, this is the data that we have. And you can see, though, a huge growth. Now, blue is mobile games and green is PC games. PC gaming is not growing as much anymore, but it's still a really big part of that stack. Mobile, gaming's, mobile gaming is currently smaller, but it is going at a much brisker pace to higher levels. Let's talk a little about gamers who are spending all that money. People like to play on multiple devices. So there are 94% of Chinese gamers are mobile gamers, but 73% are PC gamers. That's a huge crossover. And then only 7% play on consoles. OTT is over the top, set top boxes for TV-based gaming that you might get from your cable company or something like that. Consoles are very low there in stark contrast to very high here. Why? Because here they are legal. There they were banned for 14 years. And for 14 years of a ban, you're not going to get any legitimate revenue. But you will get a lot of illegally imported, what we call gray market sales. That's an actually legitimately sold product that was illegally imported into the market and resold to an unknowing customer. Um, we have, but now the consoles are, are legal, but there's been such an ensconced culture of PC gaming and mobile gaming that no one really cares about consoles over there. And oh, by the way, that regulations part, they're not approving very many games. So, and by the way, the prices are higher than they are here. So it's not a very compelling business market for the console space. Who knows, it might get better. Um, we see this, I don't remember what she says, one of these is the laser, but anyway, uh, on the dark blue part, you can see that 32% of the gamers play one to seven hours a week and then the percentages go up higher. If you add the hardcore and the super hardcore, so people playing more than 22 hours a week, and there were a couple people in this room who raised their hand, um, a couple people out of, I don't know, it, that, it was probably, what, 3% of the audience, maybe. And there we have 25% of the audience is playing more than 22 hours a week. Out of all the gamers, and this is hundreds of millions of gamers we're talking about. Um, 
And these are all abbreviations of genres, and I won't have to bore you, but it's mob multiplayer online battle arena, first person shooter, role player game, and puzzle. And then we have a lot of people interested in esports, but again, I don't want to spoil the rest of my presentation for you. I've mentioned this already that there are a lot of internet cafes, and the, the trend had been that it was slipping down, and then it raised back up the advent of these uh, MOBA games. And they used to be utilitarian to go, like I mentioned, and now they're just sort of a place for fun. We got to do a really fun project last year to help inform the architectural design of a chain of high-end internet cafes that would be used for pretty much exclusively for esports training and esports playing. And so we got to interview and um, do focus groups and do surveys with gamers who like to play esports and like to go to iCafes and get all the features and functions that they were interested in and then watch all of that work get put into true architectural drawings so that they could develop a chain of internet cafes. So the things are, are moving towards the use of these for esports tournaments for the most part. This is what one would look like. This is, this is one configuration. Here's sort of a stadium seating where they watch the tournament go on. And this is an observation room. But one of the coolest things about Chinese gamers is the fan culture. So this is actually a picture of a concert that put on by a company called Billy Billy, which is <laughs> sort of like YouTube in that it's user-generated content but you have to pass a test in order to contribute content there. You have to pass a test that says you are familiar with ACG, anime, comics, and gaming. And it's a super long, it's 100 questions, evidently. And, but once you're in, you get to post, you get to comment, you get to do stuff. And this concert is of amateurs just rocking it out on stage, giving it all they've got. And I think that would be pretty fun to watch a concert of YouTubers going up and who have been pre-screened and approved and whatever. But all those people are using all their digital devices. Oh, and oh, by the way, the tickets were like 200 US dollars to go and sold out in seconds. So it's a really popular thing to go to this concert. ไม่ถังว่าเล่นเกมแล้วได้อะไรเพราะโลกของเกมเป็นยูนิเวอร์สที่ไม่มีอะไรมาขอกันคุณอยากเป็นอะไรก็ได้ทุกอย่างทุก
So to give you some perspective here, 24.5 million people watched the Game 5 of the 2017 NBA Finals. But 106 million watched the 2017 League of Legends World Championships. And 46 million watched the Intel Extreme Masters World Championships. And 95% of these people are in China. I mean, it's a whole world and China, basically. So the prize pool for the International Dota 2 Championship is $24 million. That's a lot of money. And the total tournament viewing hours for all the people who were watching was 15 billion hours. So we think that esports is very, is, I personally think it's the number one driver to playing games for the foreseeable future. Even if you are not playing esports, there is going to be such um, interest in the culture of professional gaming like there is for Hollywood. These people are now cult figures. They are all huge stars. They would, people would line up for blocks to get an autograph from a professional gamer or even a professional gaming announcer who gets paid like a million dollars a year in China just to shout cast is what it's called, shout cast the tournaments. And people line up forever just to get their autographs. And so there's a lot of stuff where that this, this fandom and this culture of esports um, viewers is causing people to want to try to play the game. So they might try to play on their mobile phone and they might want to play on their PC. Or a game like called Honor of Kings is the mobile phone equivalent, more or less, of League of Legends. And people thought that that would detract gamers from playing League of Legends, but actually it drew people into playing League of Legends and vice versa. So there is a lot of, um, a lot of uh, oomph behind the notion of gaming and gaming usage and revenue over time thanks to esports. Here we say that 123.5 million play esports but they don't watch any videos. But 93.7 million watch the videos or the streaming or the tournaments but they don't play. And the 164 million watch and play, that's a lot of people. So eSports is the top video game, the gaming video category. So we talk about, the, in, in the United States, we have something called Twitch. And in China, there are a whole bunch of Twitch alternatives. But you would go to a website and watch this people playing live, streaming, or get a tutorial on how to play, or watch a tournament that's live. And it's big money. It's big business now. And so eSports is the most important thing to the viewers who go to gaming video sites. It's really cool that eSports exists because it really is the first time that you can have a truly global, first of all, competition and global audience all at the same time because it takes place digitally. So even the teams don't have to be right next to each other, but they typically are in these big tournaments. And the viewers can be everywhere. Now, we said 95% of them are in China, but they're throughout China. And so it's pretty interesting that you can have something so, so Im uh, immersive for the culture and still be global. There are no borders. It doesn't matter who's president, whatever. They're just playing esports across all countries. So the, for this reason, lots of people, are, lots of companies are quite interested with Esports, Coca-Cola or Ford or any kind of brand you've heard of wants a piece of this market. The NBA, the MLB, all the real sports want a piece of this market. And so it's really kind of changing the way promotion, PR, advertising, and what the future of getting in front of young people who are trying to decide what to do with their money, it sort of changes the whole approach to this audience. Just like blockchain and cryptocurrency, it's all part of the same thought process. So we think that this is actually changing the way game developers are going to be thinking in the future. They used to think maybe this is going to be a fun game. Now they think, is this going to be a fun game for a team that's going to want to compete against each other and play all the time to get better and then there'll be a tournament at the end? Because that's where it all comes from. So the development world is changing as a result of this. Even if this, the, they des but the thing is, even if a development team or studio were to say, we want to build this game because it looks like it'll be popular for eSports, the reality is only the community can determine if it's an eSports title. 
Only the players themselves can say, hey, this is more fun than we thought. We'd like to form teams and play this. And it's never going to be that the company develops a game and says, hey, we have a hit esports title. Everyone come play it. They'll say, we have a nice title, and I hope you all play it. And then suddenly it evolves into an esports title. And that's what's fascinating to watch. So where is all this money for esports? There's advertising and sponsorship. There's in-game spending, which does not count as esports revenue. This is just the amount of money that people spend in the game. And then there are prize pools. The prize pools are pretty small compared to the amount of money being spent in the game, but these will grow. And then there are all kinds of different ways to watch esports and equipment that you need. There's an enormous infrastructure going on here. There are teams, professional teams, but there are leagues and tournaments. There are publishers. A lot of these are Chinese, Tencent, Perfect World. This is, these are Chinese companies, and the rest of them up there are successful in China. There's streaming media. So I was mentioning about Twitch. There are a lot of, of channels here that you can see that are Twitch alternatives for China. Um, there are platforms where you can compete. There are communication devices to chat with your friends and your teams. And then there are all this infrastructure and services. Uh, there are some, such as ReadyUp, is a company that is providing kind of a matchmaking or a LinkedIn type service for gamers to get connected with each other, find people that they might want to play with, and then have a team management platform. Uh, like my kids play soccer in the real world, and we use something called TeamSnap. And it's sort of like TeamSnap plus LinkedIn plus a matchmaking service all in one. So there are all kinds of different new products and services that are em emerging because of this esports world. And China dominates in esports. 200 million fans in China by the end of the last year, and 11 billion video streams in 2016. The next highest country was in, or region was North America with 2.7 billion video streams. Um, Tencent is a big investor. Alibaba is a big investor. There are also big investors in just about everything. And oh, by the way, Tencent owns about half of China's market, which, as we said, is about 25 to 40% of the world market. So Tencent is the big gorilla in the room, no doubt about it. Chinese teams have been, are really popular. Everyone knows them. Like I said, they might, they'll, they'll know them like they know Matt Damon or Brad Pitt. They know these players really well. Uh, and so those tournaments have been driving iCafe usage as well, as I mentioned. Mobile has its own level of mobile game esports, which are another fantastic phenomenon to drive the usage and also the promotion of the bigger screens, because you don't want to really play esports on a tiny little screen. So the phone companies that are making big screens are loving the esports world. I mentioned Tencent, and here it is again. Tencent is that big orange block. It's almost 50% of the public PC game publishers in China, publicly traded, I mean, and nobody else comes close. This is for PC games. And then here you have mobile games. 48.7% is Tencent, and NetEase, this was last year, 24.5%, but even NetEase's share is whoops, going even bigger and bolder, and they are the two companies to deal with for mobile game distribution in China or publishing, I should say. But there are a lot of other ones, and those two have a very big share in the market. If we look at this list of popular games from December 2017, you'll see a lot of games that come from Chinese companies, but you'll also see a lot of, com of games that would not be popular globally if it weren't for the Chinese gamers. I mean, pretty much every game on here is popular because it's popular in China. Here we have mobile, and it's the same story. If you're going to make it in this world, you've got to make it in China. That's, what the, that's the take home message here, people. That's it. Regulations, though, are going to make it hard for you to do that. So there's a huge game approval process. I alluded to this earlier. Uh, all foreign games have an even extra rigid track that they must proceed down before getting approved. Domestic games have a slightly less rigid track to proceed down before getting approved. And you're not allowed to operate your games directly unless you're a domestic company. That's because of the threat to the infrastructure, telecom infrastructure. Um, there is no such thing as gambling officially in China, and no such thing as what we call RMT, real money trading, 
You can't get paid real money for playing your games, except sometimes people do. So go figure. There are a whole lot of rules in China, and not all of them are enforced. Let's just start with that. Maybe you guys heard that once or twice, though, and from somebody else. Um, and there are things, protections against things like lottery or um, lucky boxes and treasure boxes and lucky draws and all sorts of different rules. Uh, even the notion of fantasy sports is considered gambling, so that has not evolved yet. But I think that there's going to be fantasy esports and probably in China first. That's what I think. Mark it here. You all heard it first. Lisa said so. Um, so there are real name registrations required too. You have to register with your actual ID card and your real name. People get around that all the time. They use daddy's real name and they're underage and so they can still play or whatever the case may be. There are lots of things to protect minors, like they're not allowed to go to internet cafes until they're 18, only they do. And they're not, internet cafes are supposed to be closed at midnight, only they're open all night. So there are a lot of stuff that you can't really understand. More regulations. What? Are you kidding? Yeah, we could go on for 20,000 pages. In fact, we did. We published a report last year. It was about 100 pages long on just the current regulations governing the Chinese games market. It's free, too. You all can get one. Uh, so there are regulations on live streaming. There are regulations on the games. There are regulations on for anti-addiction. There are all kinds of stuff. And the China game law primer is, is the report I'm mentioning. So when we talk as a company to primarily Western companies, but we also do have a good amount of Chinese and other Asian clients, uh, they want to know what's going on in China. And we say you can't really understand it until you go there. So let us go there for you since you're obviously not making the trip yourself. Let's go. So then we say to them, there are a lot of things that you're not understanding here in the West about China. First, uh, there are all kinds of policy and there are regulations about everything that we just mentioned on the previous slides and more. And the, every game, if it has any text in the game, has to be in Chinese. So let's say you have an educational game, you're trying to teach somebody English. Well, that's an exception, but you have to go through this whole exception thing for a regulation. It's pretty amazing. Um, and then the internet cafes, they're, Westerners don't understand that culture. They, don't, they can't envision all these hundreds of thousands of internet cafes and people flocking to them, 100 seats each, and all kinds of stuff going on. You wouldn't get it until you go. Um, the Android games distribution, which I mentioned earlier, with this 500 possible stores instead of one Google Play, that's something you can't really get your arms around uh, until you live there. And then gaming behavior. I started this presentation talking about some of the differences in the behavior and whatnot, and I think that's really true, that you, that you can't really envision what goes on unless you read a lot about it or talk to Chinese gamers or really immerse yourself in the culture. And then the IP. The popular games in China that are blowing doors off the revenue are not popular here, in spite of good attempts. And the popular games in the United States might be popular there if they were approved, but not always. There are lots of different things with what the IP is, um, or what the colors are, or the shapes of the characters, or the speed at which the game accelerates, or how many seconds there is from the very first time a person looks at the screen until there's something fun to do. All these differences have to do with what will be successful in two different markets, and you really as a game company would need to understand both markets to develop a game that will be successful, at least in those two markets, and hopefully study the rest of the markets around the world too. But I think if you hit North America and the West, Western Europe and Asia, or at least China, you would be getting a big percentage of the world's revenue and you might have some success in there. Um, and that, uh, let's see, there's, we think China has a lot of strengths to offer. I think that they invented these free-to-play games out of a business model. Um, the distribution, they have companies like Tencent distributing to hundreds of millions of users all day long for everything, seamlessly integrating payments and chat and everything involved. And it's very, very impressive. Um, that's the serving millions of concurrent users, too. There are so many people playing these games at the same time. How do the servers not fail? It's amazing that they can keep all this uptime all the time, keep all these people happy. Very large scale op operations. And because the market size, even if the payments from each individual are relatively low, 
in an aggregate, it's really high. And so it's a formidable market size. Therefore, these companies are making tons of cash and then can go acquire things that they're not good in or new IP or new content or new ideas or expand or try to take over the world in you know, one game at a time. And eSports, I've already explained, sort of ad nauseum, and then iCafes too. These are the things that I think they're really strong in that we are not yet strong in here and among the things that the West does not really understand about Chinese and the gaming culture.